we are excited to have for this marvelous interview, Dr. Howard John Wesley, the pastor of Alpha Street Baptist Church, and also a student in the PhD program in African American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric. So we are just so wonderfully glad to have you and that you come and take this time and share the genius that you have in preaching. Well, I don't know if I use the term genius, but it's, a, <laughs> it's an honor to uh, know those who sat in this chair before me, the women and men who we study and read, and to uh, know that I'm following in that legacy is, is humbling for me. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, you know, we, we talk about this in the PhD program all the time, so I appreciate your dedication to the legacy because there is this uh, vein of people who get up and are ignorant of the history and the legacy that they've been given. Yeah. So, you know, in a class we say nobody preaches ex nihilo, out of nothing. You come out of a tradition. So I appreciate you honoring the tradition, and that's really what these interviews are about, to honor it, to preserve it, to archive it, to discuss it, and also to carry it into the future. Yeah. So there's a lot of people who know who Howard John Wesley is, but just for the couple people that might be in the audience that don't, or do not know you, uh, what would you like uh, to say about yourself? Well, uh, if I had to summarize it, uh, I take great joy in being fifth generation preacher mm -hmm. uh, within my family, doing the research and tracing back all the way to my great great grandfather, um, which is probably why I didn't want to be a preacher. My dad was and was a pastor. And so most people will know that I ran. Um, mm -hmm. I accepted a call at 16, but figured this would be a side hustle. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do it the way a lot of other people did, you know, just kind of show up on Sunday and <laughs> preach every now and then. And so I went to school, you know, for a whole different objective, I wanted to be a doctor. Mm. And it was in my first year of medical school that I really heard the Lord call mm. um, and say, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. And I want to thank the Lord because at the time I didn't know, but Sam Proctor was at the divinity school at Duke. Mm. And I was hanging with some divinity students and he asked me why I wasn't going to seminary. Mm. And it was one conversation with Sam Proctor that pointed me to seminary. And from there, the Lord just kept opening doors and doors and doors. And so even though I never had the opportunity to sit in class with Sam Proctor, mm -hmm. to know that that one conversation impacted my life and I can write Sam Proctor on my resume somewhere, mm -hmm. kind of legitimates my calling <laughs> a little bit more, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So from there, it was just a, um, a real journey of the Lord opening doors from Massachusetts, uh, 10 years in Springfield, Mass, where I think the Lord really groomed me for destiny, which is at Alpha Street Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said five generations. So tell me about those five generations. All right. So my father was a preacher and pastor in Chicago for a long time, was an associate minister, received a call when I was about 16. Uh, so went and journeyed with him and sat underneath him with my call and clearly the most influential person in my life. Um, Which church in Chicago? Uh, Herman Baptist Church. Herman Baptist Church, old historic church, was built in 1888. Mm -hmm. Uh, which again, I didn't know was preparing me because now I pastor a church that was built in 1803. Um, so to have that kind of longevity as a people of color, you don't find many churches that are still thriving um, like that. Started doing the research, I was on a plane with a gentleman from Ireland who was telling me he could trace his family back eight generations. And it made me feel homeless. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I decided we're going to do some research on our family. So then found out that my grandmother's father Alfred Lawless uh, was a preacher in New Orleans. And matter of fact, there's a high school named after him. Mm. So it makes you begin to realize, okay, maybe the, there's more to it. Found out his father and his father's father were all preachers. And that's as far back as we could trace. So just knowing that on my grandmother's side, there are three generations. Then we hop over to my father's father's side and then my dad um, and now me. So, you know, be able to count those five generations lets me know maybe this is what God wanted me to do from the beginning. And I was just, you know, trying to trip a little bit, do something different. Those of us who do not have the generational lineage of pastors and preachers um, believe, and I heard Henry Mitchell say this as well, that those of us who have had that gener generational lineage have an advantage. Mm -hmm. So give me your feedback. Do, do you think it's giving <clears throat> you an advantage? I, absolutely. Um, I look at and I lament uh, what I see with some young preachers today who don't have those models of ministry of mothers or fathers in ministry, but have that sense of calling, but kind of flail in the wind a little bit. So right now, one of the biggest things important to me is legacy and helping younger preachers by mentoring. That, that's key to me right now because I realize how much that meant for me. Um, in two ways, one, the name Wesley meant something coming up in Chicago. And 
I had opportunities to preach at 16 that never would have come my way had it not been for my father. So, Doc, I probably preached more youth days, second Sundays in June. Uh, so by the time I got to seminary, I already had two, three hundred sermons behind me. Wow. And wow. preaching in Chicago for the likes of like a Dr. You know, e, e, uh, Dr. Curry, mm -hmm. you know, and him grooming me, preaching for Dr. Waddles and him bringing me in the back. And after everyone patted me on the back, he took out a red pen and showed me everything I did wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, same with Dr. Curry, like you would feel like you failed, <laughs> you know, because they just, they prodded you for everything you did wrong, man. But realizing that those were growing experiences. They were training me and disciplining me um, for really being able to stand and authentically with integrity proclaim the word of God. Um, and then, so my dad's the name, and then just sitting, watching him every Sunday. We've talked about this in class. A lot of black preachers learn through emulation and observation, uh, kind of like an apprenticeship model. Exactly. Um, I think one of the writers we talked about. So, you know, being just sitting under him and having that every day, going to National Baptist conventions and carrying bags and being the young man that was driving to go pick up Franklin Richardson, go pick up Dr. Jemison, go pick up Dr. Sampson and sitting in the car and just being there while these young men, while these great men of God were preaching and talking about preaching and I'm listening and they know I've got a call to preach. So that, that, that was invaluable. I, I wouldn't be where I am without that legacy. And I lament that, that there's so many who don't today, which is why it's important for me to try to replicate that, which is why Mentoring is important, which is why this program is important, being part of this PhD program, to pass that on so that others have that genius. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So now tell me about uh, preaching mentors. Who were, who were and are preaching mentors for you? Uh, clearly, my father, mm -hmm. um, learning and listening to him, which is crazy because he never had a seminary education but he just had a passion mm -hmm. for preaching the word of God. And I can remember his sermons to this day, learning to live with the things you can't change, unfinished business. Like I hear those sermons because he preach them all the time. <laughs> you know, he, he had about five sermons, and, you know, I heard all of them uh, multiple times and, and I love them. But I think part of the greater was going to the National Baptist Convention. My dad was an officer in the convention. So the convention and the Congress and the state conventions were major and we go and sit through those. So. Early in life, uh, Dr. Franklin Richardson became a mentor. I loved listening to him preach. Um, despite all the controversy, I loved listening to Dr. Henry Lyons, you know, and just that melodic voice that he had. And I fell in love with hooping, even though I couldn't do it, right. you know. So I'd go to late night, uh, which is a passion of mine, learning, learning, preaching, sitting at the feet and watching um, all these great preachers, you know, coming out of, out of Houston when I thought about uh, a. Lewis Patterson. A. Lewis Patterson at late night, you know, listening to C.A. Clark, C.A.W. Clark. Mm -hmm. um, those preachers, man, I would love sitting in there. So my mentors were more from a distance. The hands-on ones was my father, yeah. uh, Dr. George Waddles in Chicago, and then Dr. Franklin Richardson had and still has a tremendous impact um, upon my life. And as I've grown, um, I was able to incorporate some women in that circle uh, who began to impact me. So. You know, I think about like a Zena Jacques who I went to seminary with and her voice and how I began to train me. Um, Carolyn Knight came into my world through Marcus Cosby. And I gotta say, you know, not a mentor, but there's something positive about having that friendship uh, that Marcus Cosby and I have been friends for over 40 years mm -hmm. and to see how the Lord has moved our paths together um, and how we've written, we've probably written hundreds of sermons together. Mm -hmm. And we know about the partnership of having someone to bounce your, your theology and your homiletic against. Um, so all those kind of really helped shape me. So talk a little bit because we, we see sermon really as an individual enterprise, most of us. So, so if you all have done a couple hundred sermons together, talk to me about that. How, how do you all do that? <clears throat> well, I think it was one of the greatest assets learning my own voice in preaching was to have a friend who could hear the illustrations and say, no, man, you need to tighten that up this way. So we would start our sermon work together probably every Thursday evening, mm -hmm. talk about what we we're gonna preach. And then at the time, neither one of us had Saturday services. So Saturday evening, man, we were running the sermon by each other. He would tell me what he was preaching, ask me man, how could I you know, shape this a little bit better. Um, I'd run some ideas by him. He'd help me see things in the text, how to structure it. So at that time, my gift to him was illustrating, You know that I believed every sermon needed illustrations. His gift to me was being able to alliterate and structure the sermon in three alliterated points. And that was, that was grooming, that was helping us learn our voices. So every Saturday night, 
uh, for at least 10 consecutive years, we worked together on writing sermons and that helped us develop our own voice. And so that was a valuable contribution because I wasn't just sitting in isolation with pen and paper and commentaries and trusting the Holy Spirit. I had a preacher hearing my ideas um, and we, we talk them out all night long. But there were some days we didn't go to bed to three, four o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. you know, just grinding those things out. And I think that that made us both better preachers. I knew of the partnership, but this, this is uh, fresh material and I, I, I would encourage um, other pastors, particularly younger pastors, to find people that can yeah. be honest. Because oftentimes in the church, people can't be honest. No. Listen, no. They'll be honest outside your presence. Right. Yeah, but you always did a great job with the members. Right. And you, you need a no man, a no woman, yeah. uh, someone that bounces the ideas off and can help you see what you miss. Right, yeah. that's right, that's right. So uh, how would you categorize your preaching? Expository, narrative, topical? How, how would you, uh, how would you <laughs> Well, you know, now we're in this program and we've been reading <laughs> the definitions of these genres, <laughs> we see how very fluid they are. <laughs> you know, uh, you gotta give McClure's book, uh, <laughs> Preaching Terminology. <laughs> um, I would probably say a hybrid of expository and narrative. Mm -hmm. First of all, no genre is set in a structure boundary. And I think all of us, if we're good at preaching, will attempt to preach in different voices and different genres throughout the life. But 80% of the time, we probably narrow in. So I've personally defined my preaching as prescriptive preaching mm -hmm. um, in that I try to merge what I identify as a relevant life issue that is prevalent within the congregation and a text where that relevant life issue seems to be simmering within and how does this text address the relevant life issue particularly in behavior transformation which i get you know from this preacher i know about you know uh, uh that when you preach it ought to transform behavior right. but particularly what the text is encouraging us to do to believe or to become mm -hmm. and so for me the sermon i tell people if you watch me long enough it's so simple and it's probably not even profound mm -hmm. Um, I want to raise a relevant life issue, make you connect with it, make you see that relevant life issue in the text so that you and the text are now combined and how the text speaks to you in dealing with this relevant life issue. Mm -hmm. And it's really that simple, you know, and if, if God allows some grace to throw some celebration in, you know, because <laughs> you, know, you have to have some experiential preaching, uh, then, then it's all the better because that helps. Because I do believe this, that people remember, practice, and perform what they've celebrated, not what they've shouted, but what they've received as good news. And I think in our world, we have to be clear that celebration is not necessarily shouting because they're those, as you know, who want to reduce it to simply a charismatic, cathartic moment without understanding that this is much deeper. We're writing on what you call those inner tapes, those core mm -hmm. principles and values that allow people to grab onto that as good news and then they're encouraged to practice what the text prescribed. And so I bring in a little bit of you know, my medical desire to want to help people, uh, but I believe the text prescribed. They, they teach us what to do, to believe, and to become. See, one of the things that, that the prescriptive homiletic that is what what's develops in a, in a PhD program is you get to name your own homiletic. Right. In other words, you're doing it already, mm -hmm. but you haven't named it. Right. So then you read in the field. Yeah. And then you put that together and then you're able to name with a kind of exactness and clarity what you're doing, why you're doing it. Mm. I mean, that's an excellent summary of your preaching. And I'm proud of it because you knew it, but naming it mm -hmm. is a function of being in the program. And to see how it didn't come ex nihilo. Right. You know, so when we're reading Paul Scott Wilson, I say, oh wait, Brian Chappell, Chappell, he, he has some of this, you know, and I can see the different homileticians who I may not have been exposed to, but were also in that line. So it now makes me actually more secure to know I didn't just create this out of thin air. I'm not some genius. Right. This has been a train of thought in some scholars' minds for a while, and I've embraced that as well. So now I feel like I'm grounded because I see where my own methodology mm -hmm. is in the field, in the discussion, and now I can ask myself, and how do I contribute to that? Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And so then, this is what I say about, you know, theory. What, this is what theory does. You know, it's like, you know, you can play the piano and then you can take music theory that adds to it. You can preach and then homiletic theory 
adds to clarity about what, and we have a lot of people who are marvelous preachers, marvelous. Yeah. I mean, they can do it, but then to pass that on to somebody else right. or to mentor other people, you gotta be able to name it. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Right. Why are you doing what right. you're doing, right. Right. you know? So I want to, want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the Wesleyan quadrilaterals, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, in class, we had this big discussion uh, about, about scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, mm -hmm. and that every preacher ranks. So, so for some preachers, scripture, right. tradition, reason, and experience. Mm -hmm. So for some folks, tradition, <laughs> right. scripture. Right. So I remember your formulation, so tell me, tell me your formulation. Well, one, I think a lot of preachers are just unaware of how all four factor in. Right. No one is just all biblical and all scriptural. Right. We bring, that's almost like to suggest that there's no bias in our own preaching, that it's purely me exposing the word of God. No, we all have our fingerprints on it. Wow. As I've gotten older, so I grew up strict Baptist, you know, sola scriptura. The Bible's infallible, inerrant, and insufficient, right? And sufficient for our salvation. There's nothing wrong uh, with scripture. And I realized the older I've gotten that if I used to have scripture at 90%, it's come down to 60. And I balance that with experience that I believe is authentic in understanding God with reason and with tradition uh, to keep more of a holistic balance. So scarily, I believe I'm more of a 25, 25, 25, 25 now, mm -hmm. that, that scripture is the leading dominant voice mm -hmm. in my sermon preparation, but I bring other sources in. Let me give you an example. We are at Alpha Street making a move towards inclusion, um, a belief that sexual identity and orientation should not preclude anyone from ministry involvement. A um, little bit different than opening and, and affirming, but we like to say inclusive and welcoming. And part of that discussion required us to ask, how do we hear from God on this? You know, where, where, where are our sources? And of course, in the Baptist church, everyone said we run to the Bible. And one of the things that's been critical for me is going to Acts 15, where Peter and Paul are having this debate with the elders around circumcision of Gentiles. And if you read that passage correctly, scripture is the last thing they begin quoting. They don't just run to the laws of Moses. Paul begins to talk about his experience with, with Gentiles being converted. They begin to talk about what's practical and reasonable. What has the tradition been? Then scripture comes in almost as the last voice. Not to say that it's a lesser voice, but it is a recognition that there's a model in scripture that says that as we discern the things of God, it is not simply quoting scripture that helps us understand it. That's the danger for me. And I want our congregation to accept that there are other voices that guide and govern our understanding of scripture. So I'll give you an example, when, when you get Jeff Sessions quoting Romans to justify an immigration policy that clearly violates God's concern for stranger and immigrant and wants to justify it in Bible, I use that to tell my church, scripture quoting cannot be all that we do. Mm -hmm. Because even Peter recognized you can twist and, and twist and d lead to your own destruction. So there are these other voices that I think we have to hear people's authentic relationship with God. What's your deepest core values about God? What do you believe most deeply? Where do you believe you see God most clearly in scripture? So I believe we have to develop a hermeneutical norm from our own understanding of scripture that then helps us go back and reread scripture correctly so that there's some things I can say that's not God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, happy are those who dash their enemies' children's heads against a rock I don't know if I, I put that on God. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've gotten out of this bibliology. Valerie Bridgman said something in our church once that I will never forget. She said, if God isn't bigger than your Bible, then your Bible is God, <laughs> right? And I've held on to that. And these readings that we've been going through in class now challenge to understand, are you preaching the gospel or are you preaching the Bible? And which one are we called to preach? And I love what's getting ready to come up as we deal with Dr. Reznor, this understanding. You have to understand what your understanding of the gospel is in order to read the Bible correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm working out. What is my definition of gospel? And that comes through my experience with God, through my tradition, 
through the revelation and inspiration of the Holy Spirit and my reading of scripture. All that shapes my gospel, which then helps me read my Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, thank you for such a wonderful articulation. I think um, you just articulate masterfully, you know, the things that we've been learning both together, because not only do you all learn as I also learn, because I, I do some of the reading, not all of it, but I do some of the reading and in some of the discussions we've had. Wait, you made us read some stuff you didn't have to read? Well, if I teach the class, I read it. <laughs> okay, right, okay, so, okay, right, okay. So I, I have, I've taught four of the classes. Yes, so now yeah. the, in that stuff, yeah, I oh, have read yeah. it. Yes, no, but you know, we've had more than four classes, yeah, yeah. Other, other people teaching, so. But um, so then from there, talk to me about your sermon preparation method. So for me, the sermon always begins in one of two places, and this is what I've tried, when I've had an opportunity to teach preaching, I try to pass on. Um, either a text God has pressed on my heart, or maybe is appropriate for where we are in the Christian calendar. We are not a lectionary-based church. I believe if I was, then I'd probably always begin with the text. So it's either a text or a relevant life issue. Um, that life issue comes from pastoring and being engaged with members and believing that as I see where most people are struggling with either in their walk with the Lord or with what's going on in the world, I believe that there are probably two, three hundred, maybe two, three thousand more people in church who deal with that same issue. Um, relevant life issues are all around us, um, if you're listening. Um, it was um, Cleophas LaRue who said he was interviewing Gardner Taylor, and he asked Dr. Taylor, did he ever struggle with sermon writing? And Dr. Taylor said, yes. And Dr. LaRue said, well, what do you do? He said, I go visit members in the hospital, mm -hmm. right? And sermons are birthed from interaction with people. Um, so I either have a passage, John 4, or I have an issue, um, overcoming depression. My very next step is after I've identified clearly one or the other to go find the X. So if I've got a text, I've got to start doing my exegetical work to figure out, okay, what's the relevant life issue underneath this? It's what um, Dr. Allen pushed on us, this hermeneutic of analogy. As we get out of the culture of the writer and authorial intent, what is the deeper human issue that's in this text that is relevant and real for all of us? If I have a relevant life issue, now comes the harder one of trying to find a biblical text where that life issue is in the text. And that requires really that requires that you be versed in scripture, that you be reading the Bible for things other than simply scripture, I mean sermon writing, so that if I'm meditating and trying to um, find an example of someone who's been rejected and I want to preach on overcoming rejection, in my mind I'm asking myself where are there issues of rejection in the Bible? Um, now I will say that my methodology tends more towards narrative texts. Mm -hmm. um, the Psalms and poems are probably easier, but epistles are hard. So the method I preach, I realize I have to break that method because if I just stick with it, I'll never deal with Pauline epistles. I'll never deal with half the New Testament because I tend to draw towards narrative. Um, so after I found a text and an issue, I then try to find the opposite one. Um, and then comes the homiletical exegesis you know, trying to understand what does this text say about that life issue or what is this character or this model in scripture, how do they respond to it, either in a positive way or a negative way, um, that we can mimic their behavior. Um, and then one of the final pieces for me is doing a diagnosis of the relevant life issue so that I don't want to just say we're going to deal with depression. You know, I want to be able to either through my own narrative or through the narrative of another really bring out that depression, bring out that rejection so that you connect more with it. It's easy for me to say, let's have a sermon about rejection. It's much more difficult to be able to say, have you ever been in a place where you really wanted something and it didn't want you? Mm -hmm. And be able to touch in and tap to people's pain or people's identification with that issue. It was once said um, that you can't trust any prescription without a good diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? So if you haven't done the examination, I'm not gonna take the, I'm not gonna take the pill. So my objective is, in the introduction to do an analysis of the relevant life issue so that the hearer feels the connectivity to it and say, he's preaching to me today. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the greatest things we can have as a preacher is for somebody to come and say, how'd you know what I was going through, mm -hmm. right? Holy Spirit inspiration. After that connection comes the transition of being able to share 
how that relevant life issue is what Moses is dealing with in this passage. It's what the disciples were struggling with as they were on the boat with Jesus. So now you see the connection at that deeper level of analogy. And from there, we then talk about, well, what does this text say to us about dealing with that life issue? What do the disciples do? What did Moses believe? How were the children of Israel transformed to be able to be faithful to God in the midst of this relevant life issue? And then make that transferable to you and me as to what we're supposed to do, believe, and become, and find a way to celebrate what that does in our lives in terms of keeping us connected with the Lord. So it's a simple structure, but there are a lot of pieces that have to develop. And so for me, I can never just sit down on Saturday and write a sermon. You know, there's, there are a lot of pieces that need to take shape. I need to do my analysis of the relevant life issue, do the research, do the statistics, what, what's out there in the medical journals about depression so that I can at least stand and be somewhat versed on what I'm speaking about. And then comes the homiletical exegesis, the work on the text itself. Um, and this program has given me a desire and passion to get back into that even more so. Not simply reading and trusting on my seminary education, but getting back into ATLA, pulling up more journals, reading more uh, commentaries to understand the depth of this, this text that I'm dealing with. Um, and then comes the structuring of it all together. And the toughest part for me, because I'm not a manuscript preacher, is to have it done, have it outlined strong enough that I can then meditate on it. So my Saturday is usually spent um, quiet time sitting, preaching the sermon in my head time and time and time again so that I can trust the Holy Spirit to use me in those four preaching moments over the weekend to get that word out. So it's the preparation, it's the meditation, then it's the delivery. So there's not a written manuscript behind your sermons? There actually is. So, uh, and I think we all go through phases. There's a time it was eight handwritten yellow legal spaces. There's a time when it was a a uh, piece of paper folded in half, writing on the back and the front. There's a time when it was three note cards. Uh, There's a time when it was two pages handwritten, what I call a strong outline. But now I realize I type faster, so I have a typed two-page strong outline that I then write on uh, with color coordination. So for me, the colors are important. Um, I write outline stuff in red, and that lets me know that's Bible. If it's blue, that's an illustration. If it's green, it's semantic. It's either Hebrew or Greek, and if it's black, it's just narrative. So I can look down, and so rather than writing out a full illustration, so let's say I'm gonna use an illustration about us being in class. I'm not gonna write it all out. I'm gonna take blue ink and say, Dr. Thomas in class, right? And that's all I'm gonna put on the paper. So when I look down quickly, I see that blue Dr. Thomas, and it reminds me, you gotta tell the story, right? So it allows me to keep eye contact with the congregation to just tell the story um, and then look back down and see red, John 4. Mm -hmm. And then I know I gotta go back to John 4, but that's after 20 years of preaching. Oh, that's what, that was gonna be my next, please. <laughs> we don't want to start out. <laughs> no, that's after 20 years of, um, of preaching. And someone said it takes 10 years to learn your voice, and they were right. Yeah. So after 10 years, I learned who I was, and then start to try to, I don't wanna say master, but sharpen that, so that now I'm comfortable in my own skin, and I can look down at a strong outline and know what I'm trying to preach. I want you to tell me about a time when um, you felt that God really used you, that, 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 I mean, God used you, it was just so overwhelming, uh, a time in your preaching ministry where you just knew God used you just profoundly. That's easy. So we have four services, Saturday and three on Sunday. At the time it was three, two on Sunday. And I typically preach the same message uh, because if not, the crowds won't leave and we've got to shift people. So it was a Saturday evening. I preached a sermon, went home. Saturday is my Sabbath time, so I just lay down and go to bed. I woke up early in the morning on Sunday. It was about maybe 5 o'clock, and my phone had blown up. I mean, just text after text. I think I had like over 120 tweets that had come directly to me. And they all said, I wonder what... Pastor Wesley's gonna preach this morning. And I'm trying to figure out, why do people, why are they concerned? I'm gonna preach what I preached last night. Turned on the television, George Zimmerman had been acquitted. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, that happened late on a Saturday mm -hmm. night. Yeah, I remember. I remember. And I woke up on Sunday morning not knowing it. Mm -hmm. And it was five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I've got two choices. Well, three, I can just preach what I was gonna preach and not deal with it. Maybe we deal with it at altar call, you know, because 
that's what I want to do. Or God, I got to preach something else. And I knew God was saying, you got to preach something else. I mean, it's five o'clock. Service is in two hours, right? What do I do, Lord? And I don't want to, a moment like that, everyone's coming in. That's a relevant life issue. Everyone's walking into that church in a predominantly black Baptist church and they need a word from the Lord and dock you up. You are God's voice in that moment. We need you because we about to burn this city down. You got to say something because we mad as heck, right? And all that is coming together and I got to preach. And I, my method start kicking in. And I start saying, where have people had to deal with a painful verdict? And the Lord immediately put me in the mindset of Simon of Cyrene. Mm -hmm. Jesus is convicted wrongly. Mm -hmm. He's done nothing. Mm -hmm. He's sentenced to die and Simon's got to carry the weight. Mm -hmm. He's got to bear the weight of it. And I knew that's what I had to preach. So then the question is, okay, so what does Simon do to help us? Because when you got two hours, you got to go to your stick. Like, <laughs> right? I got two hours. I got to use my method, right? <laughs> this ain't no time to try to, be, <laughs> try to be like anybody else. You got to be you. Right. So I started looking at what Simon does and how Simon carries the weight and what it is that enables him to carry the weight that his sons are right there, mm-hmm. right? And If he doesn't carry this weight correctly, the Roman soldiers could not only take him, they could take his sons. So he's got to deal with this for his children's sake. Mm -hmm. Um, Christ walks in front of him, he drags the cross behind, that there's something about keeping your eyes on the Lord in moments like this. And Simon of Cyrene, he's he's from Africa. Now we don't, the the Bible, you know, interpreters don't like to give Northern Africa, Africa credit, Mm -hmm. but Simon of Cyrene is from Africa, he's an African. And if anyone has the ability to carry the weight, it's those that have some Africa in their DNA, because we've been through this before. Mm -hmm. So those are the three movements. And the sermon was called When the Verdict Hurts. Mm -hmm. And it's it's probably one of the most viewed that I've had out there. Mm -hmm. And I I jokingly tell people, if you hear it and think that there was a lot of preparation, you're dead wrong. That was all God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, for that moment to have a message that touched people because you had to touch the hurt. You had to touch the anger. You had to touch the frustration. Otherwise, it's inauthentic, Mm -hmm. right? Don't just get up here and give me a shout. It's going to be okay. No, you got to give me a moment to say, I'm mad as heck about this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, And from there, got into the text, preached the three points. And it was written up in Time magazine. Um, Elizabeth Diaz, a writer, called it the best sermon she's ever heard around the George Zimmerman verdict. And I have to say, only God, mm. only God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't have written that in two hours. I couldn't have written that in two weeks if I'd known it was coming, mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. But again, I've been meditating on the Via De La Rosa that whole week. I've been rereading Jesus' road to crucifixion. So that was in me already. It says, you, you, gotta, you can't just read Bible to write sermons. Cause there are gonna come moments when you need something in you that the Holy Spirit can pull out. And that was purely a God moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now let's go to the other side. So give me a time when it was most difficult. I mean, personally or in the church, or it's just your most difficult moment that you had to preach. You know what? Some people would probably say funerals. Um, we had a member who unfortunately just recently committed suicide. But I didn't find that the most difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, because I believe being able to tap into people's pain and validate their experience and pull people out of judgment, that's an easier task. My most difficult sermon was the last sermon I had to preach when I was leaving my church. Which church? St. <laughs> John's Congregational Church in Springfield. and. It was not a pleasant departure. Not that there was scandal, but Alpha Street had called. I turned them down. And the Lord, I felt like I had a Jonah experience. Oh, you going to Alpha Street, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
and then to come back and tell the church. So when I turned Alpha Street down, I told my church I'm staying, mm -hmm. only for the Lord to convict me and have to go back and say I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And people were hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know how much of an affinity and love they developed for their pastor. It was my first church. So people were hurt and it got ugly. Mm -hmm. um, it got ugly and I had to preach a farewell sermon. Mm -hmm. And saying goodbye was hard, sermonically. Mm -hmm. You know, give you a funny story. Um, Alpha Street elected me and it was a Tuesday night. I never forget on Wednesday, um, my wife at the time called, she hollered, she was like, you gotta come downstairs. I ran downstairs. The lead story on NBC was prominent pastor leaving. This is on Wednesday, the vote was on Tuesday. Someone had called and gotten the info and I hadn't been able to get to my church yet. It's running on the news mm -hmm. before I can tell my church. Wow. So I walked in that Sunday and when I stood up, I said, I have something to tell you. I'll never get a member in the back stood up. We know GD, well, you got something to tell us. Like it was furious in there. And I never encountered that kind of hostility in a sermonic moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd never had people walk out on me or get frustrated. And to see, you know, people walking out and cussing, leaving the sanctuary while I'm trying to preach, that was tough. Mm -hmm. That was a tough moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what was the sermon? Um, Paul's farewell to the church in Corinth, you know. Um, and I tried to tie into, remember everything that's been done here. Paul planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Mm -hmm. You know, and to get them to trust that this has always been God, it always will be, and you all will be fine. Um, but it, it was not well received, there weren't any amens, and there were people getting up walking out. And more than the sermon, the delivery, can you continue to preach when you see people walking out? So what did you learn? You have to. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like, you got to preach through sleeping deacons. You got to preach through crying babies. And if you believe that where you stand is authentic and compassionate, you got to keep going. Mm -hmm. And that helped develop a discipline in me mm -hmm. um, that we don't preach for crowd approval. You could preach through folks standing up shouting all day long, right? Mm -hmm. that, that give you encouragement. Mm -hmm. So if you're connected to that response, you also have to be connected to the response of leaving or you're connected to validation knowing you're faithful, right? right? That every sermon is not gonna shout and every sermon is not gonna make people leave. But you're gonna get a mixture of both in the lifetime of your preaching if you're pastoring. Mm -hmm. um, Cause every sermon is not popular and some are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And you gotta preach them. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. yeah. So have you been back since you left? I have never been back. Um, I will be, I've been invited back to come to the city this year, mm -hmm. but even funerals, I was denied the right to come back and preach. Mm -hmm. um, this one knows the Lord closed the door, mm. you know, and I pray them well. And I know that there are many members there who pray me well there. There's something, you know, obviously hurt. Mm -hmm. And I definitely, I, I could have handled it a lot differently. I don't put it on them. There are many ways I could handle that differently. Um, but yeah, that door's just been closed. Mm -hmm. I, I've learned that um, there are some doors that are closed that only God can open. So I, I'd like to get your feedback, you know, because a congregation you pastored for 10 years, mm -hmm. people you know, that's a wound, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. So, but God does healing in some amazing ways. Yeah. So what, give me your sense of that. There's some doors God closes that we can never open again. Mm -hmm. And there's some that may have to be closed permanently mm -hmm. um, for both parties to be able to move on. I almost default to Jesus telling the disciples, I have to leave. Mm -hmm. If I don't, the next move of God can't come for you, which is the Holy Spirit. Right. So that's brought me comfort because um, it has been painful not to be able to go back. You know, a church that together we grew from 200 to 3,000, mm -hmm. you know, and to now almost be persona non grata. Like, my, man, they got every pastor's picture up but mine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> man, that hurts. <laughs> that ain't fun. Um, you know, but 
that <laughs> church continues to grow. Um, the new pastor's doing great things there with those people. So, you know, and the reality is I landed in destiny. Mm-hmm. Without that pain, I couldn't pass to where I am. Mm-hmm. And I love Alpha Tree Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. Like my prayer is, Lord, let this be the last stop on the journey. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes the pain is overcome by, so I often tell people, we just did a sermon on Job. Everyone wants to shout on God restoring Job, but if you've lost 10 kids, 10 more don't, that, that doesn't erase that. Mm-hmm. Just God continues to add to the story. Mm-hmm. And God continued to add to my story. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alpha Street ain't bad restoration. Right. Yeah, it's not bad restoration mm-hmm. um, for the pain. And so I pray for them. And there's some people there that I still am really connected to intimately, who I love, who speak with me, they'll be. They follow me where I come. They come to Alpha Street all the time. So those ties are still there. And I've had to learn to value relationship, even when I didn't have the formality of going back and preaching. Maybe some of that was ego, you know? It's the church I built. I want to go back and preach. I want the new pastor to invite me back to revival. Maybe that's ego, and maybe that's not God's will. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. That's helpful to a lot of us, so thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I would like to just in a brief way explore with you is um, the gift of Alpha Street to the Smithsonian. Mm. And I believe deeply in the power of black philanthropy. Yeah, yeah. And you and Alpha Street made a profound, so I want you to talk about it. And I want you to be, I, I don't want it, you to think that you brag. I asked you to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Let me just talk about it because I think that it's a model that um, in African-American churches that we, um, and we've always done philanthropy, and we've also been philanthropic, but I think you, you all took it to another level. So whatever you'd like to say about it, but I don't want you to think you worry about bragging because I'm asking you to say okay. it. All right. So a quick narrative about it. Um, you know, obviously the vision and fundraising for the Smithsonian began um, long before. Lonnie Bunch was out beating the p- ground long before the site was even identified. Um, and the location of the church, I mean, literally, we can, we can sneeze and, and, and be at the, at, in the middle of D.C. where it is. So the location was critical. And the church, 1803, we're 215 years old. We, we believe in the power of the story of African Americans because it's the story of God. You cannot tell the story of America without African Americans. Mm-hmm. Right? This, this country is built on our blood. Um, and that, that's prevalent in the mindset of our members. We have, we have a very unique set of members, man. We have upperly mobile, educated, HBCU. These, this is, we, it, it's strange. Almost 80% of our congregation has a lot in common. Like we, we believe the same. So one of our members was one of the head um, fundraisers. And she approached the church and said, I would like to have the bragging right of saying my church was the first million dollar donor. Um, Let me tell you how easy that was. It went through the trustees and the deacons and me and the church in less than three weeks Mm. with with near a nay vote. Mm. I I haven't been able to change the color in the bathroom (laughs) that easy at at a Baptist church. We fight over everything. (laughs) And this million dollars zipped through the congregation without any objection. The church is like, that's exactly what we ought to do. So there are two things I'm proud of. One is that we had it, mm-hmm. that we had a million dollars to give. Mm-hmm. But even more so was that we had the heart to do it, mm-hmm. that the congregation believed this ought to be our legacy, mm-hmm. right? That, that when this museum goes up, which is a testament to this nation of the story of African Americans, Alpha Street has to be part of that. Mm-hmm. We have to be. So to have a million dollars, phenomenal. To have a membership that said give it and it not hurt your ministry, even better. Mm -hmm. So we decided to, and the thought was that hopefully it will inspire other churches. Mm -hmm. And sad, you know, not bragging, but on the sad side, we were the only faith-based institution in the United States in the world to step up to a million dollars. And we know that the other churches were able not to castigate them or to, you know, speak about why they did or did not, but we thought it'd be more motivational. 
we thought it would inspire others to step up to that million dollars. Quick story. So we paid it off in three three-year increments of $330,000 each. Um, we didn't go to extra fundraising from the church. We were able to pull that out of budget. And we have this huge HBCU festival um, every year um, that we bring in all the HBCUs. Um, it's over 5,000 students that come now, hundreds of on-site applications, more than $2 million in scholarship given away. And it garnered so much attention Facebook became a corporate partner mm. and funded it at the $300,000 level. And I was just sharing with the congregation, everything we've given out comes back to us, mm. right? And that, that's the model of philanthropy. That, I mean, you want to talk about tithing the members, you got to demonstrate it, right. right? So one of the things I've learned in this program is you've got to give a stewardship of what happens with the money. That that's what encourages people to give. Amy Laramore wants to push that on us. People need to know. Demonstrate what you're asking people to do. So we gave, it comes back. That's how God operates. Uh, but we take great joy. Every time members come and you see that wall, you can't go down three names without seeing Alpha Street Baptist Church. And members take great pride in saying, that's us. I mean, so people know Amy Lermore is the philanthropic strategist for the PhD program. She works closely with me and we've raised almost $1.1 million out of the African-American church through her leadership, her training. So this, so this is for, for our viewers, so they'll know what, right. when you say Amy Lamore and in the program, that she works with us and is training us all and growing us all in philanthropy. And I think as you seek to leave a living legacy through this PhD program, it's important that people know everything we do is not just reading, studying, and writing papers. That's 98% of it, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? I mean, because right. it's a scholarly program. But we've talked about the living legacy of the church and a culture of generosity and philanthropy. And so to have sessions in class where that's what we talked about and how that's what we're charged to create in a program that we're gonna introduce to the world that's gener generous. To be able to come to this program and have no life altering debt. I mean, this, this is phenomenal, you know, and for us to be able to pass that on so that you can come out of this with this PhD, help change the world and not be broke as you were coming out of undergrad. Right. You know, th th it's phenomenal. Right. Um, and I appreciate learning as much about the scholars and homileticians as I have about the culture of generosity because it's what I preach at church. So I want you to talk about the scholarship that you have in, in made for the next cohort. Now, you know, you, this ain't bragging because I'm asking you to talk about this, that, that, that the investment in, the next, in cohort two. So let me say a little bit about that. Well, when I found out that I received a scholarship and that Alpha Street Baptist Church committed to the scholarship that paid for my full uh, journey into this PhD, I realized that was money I wasn't gonna have to pay. Um, and really moved by Amy sharing with us like how important that is and how we have an obligation to pass that on. And so the cohort together began talking about creating a scholarship. But I also knew that um, I felt I had to personally, in the name of my mom and dad. Man, this is a mess, man. My, um, I graduated Duke without a near student loan because my dad paid it all, right? And he, he always tell people, oh yeah, he on, the, he on the Alvin John Wesley scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> he on my scholarship. So um, in honor of his legacy and what he gave me, I want to be able to pass that on. And so, you know, I approached you all and said, can we, can I fully fund a student in the name of my mom and dad? And without too many restrictions, I'd like for them to study something in the Baptist faith or somewhere if they're gonna do a preacher or, or some project, it's not limiting, but that's what would be my desire because that's what was important to my dad. And that's what's important to me and to my mom. And, you know, to be able to have that left over from, you know, my dad's life and legacy uh, is important to me. So now, I'll take great joy in knowing that another student in the second cohort is gonna have the same experience I had, you know, to enjoy this journey, to grow, to, to pass on, and not have life-altering debt, and we'll remember the name Alvin John Wesley and Helen Wesley. Mm -hmm. That means a lot to me. That's what we call the culture of generosity, mm -hmm. and that's an inherent part of the PhD program, that, that we, we, we are given to and we give freely, so thank you so much. And I know that some of this is difficult. You know, I know you don't want to 
it's not bragging. I think for me, it's helping uh, people see what God can do yeah. and what responsibility and part they can take because I think I am extremely proud of the fact that um, the overwhelming vast majority of the donors to the PhD program, 99%, and we want everybody to give, I'm not excluding anybody, come right out of the black church. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's one thing you have a PhD program and it's grants from corporations and this and foundations and these things, but when the church so I have so much support out of the, out of the, Af the black church that it, it emboldens me and encourages me and lifts me. So, and you're part of that. So I just want to you know, thank you for that. Well, the freedom it gives to the program, you're not controlled. You know, we don't, we don't have to jump through hoops of other corporations and foundations. Um, I think it's, it's critical. And in any fundraising, you know, when you go to someone else, they're going to ask you, well, how much you bring to the table? Right. How much do you get from your own people? Right. You know, and to be able to say we've got this from the black church itself, only strengthens the position if and when you decide you want to grab by the money from other corporations foundation when it's necessary. So what, what has the what has the PhD? I mean so you know people will say you 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 know you you got uh, Alpha Street, you you preach all over the country, you know, you've got major chops as a preacher. Why would you need a PhD in African American preaching? Hmm. Probably for several reasons. One is my own personal development. Um, I always want to be better. You know, Peyton Manning was known as a great quarterback, and he'd tell you he spent hours studying game film, not just of his own, but of the greats that came before him. So for me, the study helps me become better. And with humility, I say, and I'm grateful, that my church doesn't regret giving me the time and space to do the PhD program, because even leadership comes back and says, your preaching is better. You know, the depth that you bring to the preaching moment is better. Some of it's unconscious just because I'm reading more. I do better in a discipline course of study. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you, my brain is firing on different things. I'm being exposed to different thoughts. I'm being exposed to different writing. It's, it's making me a better preacher. I, I, feel, I feel stronger when I stand in the pulpit because I've got grounding. And it wasn't just I opened up the Bible and came up with three good points and a shout. <laughs> you know, and now I'm gonna challenge mind in different ways. So the breath of reading is making me a better preacher. And ultimately, I am fully aware that all of us have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to live beyond mine in the pulpit. Um, we, we know stories of great preachers, kind of like Ali, who got in the ring one time too much, you know, mm -hmm. that the church would have done better to pass it off. Alpha Street is an amazing church that deserves an amazing succession plan that requires me to recognize my time as pastor is going to end. Um, I don't want to do this till I'm 70 or 80. 60, 65, I want to know that I can walk away. Because um, the stress and strain, we, you once asked a question about LeBron James, how many dunks does he have in his legs? He's great right now, but how many does he have? How many great sermons do we have in us? You know, and I don't want to have to preach beyond 65. I want to preach when I, when I want to, not because I have to, you know, and the stress of, uh, I don't want no more meetings, man. <laughs> so, so the question is what comes next? And the clear train for me is if I'm serious about legacy is the academy, you know, to be able to teach and to write. People can listen to our sermons, but you've pressed upon us is writing, right? There's where the discipline comes in. That's where the legacy is left. And that's where we're validated. Um, and as I was, exploring the program, and you and I were just talking in general at one of the um, consortiums you pulled together, you said something that I'll never forget. Until you have the PhD, you're always adjunct. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with adjunct, no, wrong. nothing wrong. But I want to do more than that. Howard John Wesley wants to sit as a full-fledged partner at the table and have my thought, my work, and my scholarship be respected. Mm -hmm. And the PhD is necessary to be able to leave with academic scholarships, something for generations that come afterwards. So I would pray that I'm able to make a contribution to the field that 20 years from now someone's talking about. Yeah. You know, the same way, you know, I'm reading about other preachers that they'll not read about me, but read what my thought and theology and theory of preaching was. And so the PhD journey, it, it's making me a better preacher. It's helping me prepare for the future. And to be honest with you, it gives me a respite from church, you know? 
Um, every Monday when I'm in the library, I'm not, I'm not thinking about meetings. I'm not worried about budget. I'm in there grinding out papers and reading and knowing that I'm getting smarter, <laughs> like that my brain is getting better. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'll be able to walk into CTS, I'll be able to walk into Duke, I'll be walking to Emory, I can walk into Yale and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I love it. it. It's got me thinking at a different level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so about preaching and about African American preaching, I'm gonna give you the word. Uh, anything that you like to say, any you know a lot about it. You know a lot about preaching. You know a lot about church growth. You know a lot about a lot of things. So I want to give you a moment to just whatever you like to say. I um, I, I think that with these interviews. People are watching these things like crazy, and um, they've been tremendously, tremendously successful. And people on other continents are watching, are going to be watching. And I, you also said to me prior to the interview that posterity, you know, that, that. So I've asked you a lot of questions, but I want you to, your moment, what is it that, if I didn't ask, or, and what, what is it that you would like to say? I think the humility of recognizing that none of us are bigger than our tradition. Mm -hmm. And it's expedient for us to know our tradition, mm -hmm. um, to contribute to it, to add on, to never feel like we've mastered the field. Mm -hmm. You know, so if people ask why are you in the program, I'm not a master preacher. You know, I don't, I don't think we ever get there. Mm -hmm. um, would I be honored one day for my name to ring with a Sam Proctor? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But it takes work and authenticity mm -hmm. and faithfulness and humility to get there with a scholarship. And I believe bridging the academy and the church is the necessary next move for the black church to continue to thrive. That we've had this unnatural divide as if scholarship and preaching were two different fields. You know the old theory, those who can't preach teach, right? right? right. <laughs> and I want, to, I want us to change that model, that preachers do teach and have the respect to the academy and can pass on to the next generation that comes. And so to all those who would aspire to preach, who feel a call to preach, um, don't think you've ever mastered the craft, but always become a student. Always become a student of preaching. Um, Cleophus LaRue in one of his books says, you know, the way you become a better preacher is you go hear good preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, so every week I'm trying to hear good preaching. I'm trying, even bad preaching you learn from. Mm -hmm. Become a student of the art so that we become better practitioners in the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay. Well, thank you so much for this interview. I appreciate you. Thanks, and I appreciate, appreciate, your, uh, appreciate uh, all that, you know, you're doing for church, African American church, Alpha Street, and um, I just look forward to us pushing on to this dissertation. Well, you know what, I'm, as w you and I, have, and you've done a presentation on it, you've shared the, the class, the genealogy of this program, you know, going way back to the King Scholars with Mitchell, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then the D-Men program, and you being one of the protégés from Henry Mitchell. I pray that someone will once say I'm one of your protégés and I'm that next generation that came out of Mitchell and Thomas and now Wesley and hopefully we continue to pass that on. Kind of like football coaches all trace their, their lineage, I'm tracing mine all the way back through you. So <laughs> for good or for bad, he's to blame for whatever I become. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'd, I'd be honored and, and I'll just say this, this, this is legacy, you know, so I had to leave two churches and um, so your experience I had a slightly different um, experience with leaving New Faith, but the, the content of it is I didn't know that I loved that place so deeply. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know how much they loved me. Mm -hmm. And we just did the work for 18 years. And so we went from no land to land to building to, to staff to second service to third service to an add on to the building, a 27 acre master plan. And I looked up at 18 years, I was just flat out exhausted, just exhausted. And um, so I, I know that. And then uh, when I left Mississippi Boulevard, I did it better. Yeah. I uh, tried to treasure and honor the relationships. Um, so I so much had to go through to get to this PhD program. Yeah. And I understand some of it now. You know, when we heard you left Mississippi Boulevard, you know, the chatter around my generation was, I mean, why would you walk away from that? Like, that's, that's premier prime. That, that's what we desire to get to. But I understand now that for some of us, that's not my final and full calling. Right. 
you know, the password is great. I want to bless people and be connected in family, but there are other things I want to do as well. And the academy and the PhD is necessary to finish out what I believe is my full assignment, which wasn't simply to pastor and to preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm. I'm. That's my. So they said, I think this is my destiny. I mean, I mean, I think New Faith is my destiny. They said Boulevard, and there are seasons in life too. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is the closing season in ministry, and it's just. So I appreciate you know you coming and being a part of the program. It's been phenomenal to have such high quality students such as yourself and the whole team. Um, and I just, it's destiny for me, and I, I'm, so I'm just trying to follow God, so. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, if you would one day say, are you in the limit, in the lineage of Thomas, I, it would be like, um, I use this, um, I, I preached um, at Trinity's, um, you know, Pastor Moss invites me for church anniversary every year, mm -hmm. and Pastor Wright was in the, was, in the pulpit as I was preaching and I talked about, you know, Amway where you had this, um, yeah. you know. Like the pyramids. Right, yeah. that, that, you know, um, all the people that have been blessed under my ministry, a percentage of blessing goes up. Yeah. Goes up. <laughs> so if I get a percentage of your blessing, <laughs> now I may be going to glory, right? <laughs> I'm gonna be in the summer. <laughs> I'm gonna be in the lineup, yes sir, <laughs> yeah.